Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Welcome to Jimmy at the Crossroads, episode 93. It is a best of Jimmy at the Crossroads edition of the show. We got a great lineup planned for you, including Emily Larson from the Washington Examiner, U.S. Senator from Colorado, Corey Gardner, Ron McLaughlin, and Sheriff Steve Reams. That's the best of lineup. Jimmy Sangerberger coming to you live next. Stay tuned. And that, my friends, is how America was made great once again. Breaking at this hour, Jimmy Sangenberger is currently at the crossroads of politics and economics. Radio broadcaster master, now the celeb on the web. He's the smarty of the party. He's in cahoots with the grassroots. Jimmy at the Crossroads brings you thought-provoking commentary, hard-hitting interviews, original satire, and the best bumper music known to man. Jimmy at the Crossroads! Gonna talk money, gonna talk politics, we're for all generations, oh what a great mix I said. Gonna talk money, gonna talk politics, grateful of all generations, oh what a great mix. I got Jimmy and the Crossroads, making sense out of nonsense. People want answers, they want to understand. They come to the crossroads and Jimmy gives them the plan. I said, gonna talk money, gonna talk politics. Great for all generations, oh, what a great mix. I got Jimmy at the crossroads, making sense out of nonsense. Come on, Jimmy, what you got? Hello, my friends, and welcome to another edition of Jimmy at the Crossroads. I'm Jimmy Sangenberger, your host for the program. Once again, bringing you engaging, intelligent talk, Sang style, here in partnership with the Washington Examiner. And it is indeed such a pleasure and a privilege to be back with you today with a best of special edition of the program. By the way, if you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do. YouTube.com slash Jimmy at the Crossroads so you can make sure to be up to date on all of our content. Make sure to click the bell button afterwards so you're notified of new videos that are posted online. And in addition, when we go live, you will get a notification and not miss a beat. Plus, be sure to follow yours truly on Twitter at Sang Center. That's saying with an E, not an A, Center on Twitter. And in addition, you can go ahead and like the Facebook page for Jimmy Sangenberger Media Personality, facebook.com slash Jimmy Sangenberger Pro. And of course, at Jimmy at the Crossroads.com, we've got the shop. We've got the Crossroads Club membership. We've got all of our content, so much more. Be sure to check out Jimmy at the crossroads.com and log on today. And of course, like, subscribe, follow all those all those good things for our friends at the Washington Examiner on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and of course at WashingtonExaminer.com. So today we've got a best of for you, and I'm looking forward to sharing some highlights from the past month or so, a month, two months, somewhere around that time frame. So today we're going to kick off with my monologue, some of my epic monologue on Frederick Douglass and his speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. That monologue then led to a couple of op-eds placed in the Washington Examiner and in The Federalist. Be sure to check out those pieces, by the way, but we'll share some of that monologue first, which we'll 
really break down some things about Frederick Douglass and the 4th of July and Independence Day and the Founding Fathers and the Constitution that were not being talked about in the mainstream media at that time. Plus, we will also share my interview with Emily Larson from the Washington Examiner, reporter at the Examiner, all about mail-in voting and the trials and tribulations that we were seeing even then several weeks ago with mail-in voting that have only gotten worse in those states that have been rushing the process forward. Plus, today, we will present my interview with U.S. Senator Cory Gardner, a sizable excerpt of that conversation from last week here on Jimmy at the Crossroads. And finally, we're going to go back to the beginning. Of all the chaos in Colorado that we've been covering, Ron McLaughlin, lead organizer of Pro Police Rally Colorado, the sixth annual Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. We're going to share some of that interview and some of my interview with Weld County, Colorado Sheriff Steve Reams, who also joined the program the day after the rally was attacked by extremist thugs on the left. The Party for Socialism and Liberation, we later learned on this program, was responsible for it. Antifa thugs were involved. You do not want to miss that conversation. If you hadn't seen it before, you want to make sure to watch what we've got in terms of the excerpts of Ron McLaughlin and Sheriff Reams about what happened in downtown Denver, Colorado on July 19th. So today, my monologue on Frederick Douglass and his speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, widely misunderstood speech, by the way. My interview with Emily Larson, reporter at the Washington Examiner. My conversation with U.S. Senator Cory Gardner running for re-election in Colorado against former Governor John Hickenlooper and Sheriff Steve Reams and Ron McLaughlin, lead organizer of the pro-police rally Colorado from a few weeks ago. Without further ado, Mr. Matouche working the Matouche magic, producer extraordinaire, let's roll the tape. One of the things going to Frederick Douglass's speech, what to the slave is the 4th of July. One of the things that he just did so compellingly was underscore the abject evil and horror of slavery. The brutality, the inhumanity, of that institution that was part of the United States of America for far too long. And James Earl Jones, some time ago, did an oral reading of a portion of the speech by Frederick Douglass, the part in particular lambasting slavery in America. Wanted to give you a taste of that. What to the American slave is your 4th of July. I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham. Your boasted liberty, an unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and Hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes that would, it, that would disgrace a nation of savages. There's not a nation of the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. At a time like this, scorching irony not convincing argument is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could reach the nation's ear, I would today pour forth 
a stream, a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quickened. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed and the crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. I don't think anybody could do an oral reading of Frederick Douglass more eloquently, more powerfully than James Earl Jones. But first of all, you listen to those words and the language and you can't help but think this guy, this man, was a slave who taught himself to read and to comprehend and to write. And in violation at that point in the 1840s, 1830s, 1840s, when he was teaching himself to read and write, it was forbidden, it was illegal, it was not permitted. And he did it, and he did it himself. And, I mean, the, the, the rhetoric, the use of language, just incredible, underscoring how remarkable of a man Frederick Douglass was. But oftentimes when people think of, as Angela Rye intimated, when people think of Frederick Douglass in his speech, what to the slave is the 4th of July, they think of the excoriating condemnation of slavery that Frederick Douglass put forward. And absolutely, that is critical. That is critical. And it was so well put, so timely, so important. There's a reason why Frederick Douglass was a leading abolitionist beyond simply the fact that he was a slave himself and then ultimately a freed slave. It was because of the kind of leader he was in this regard. Well, let's go to pick, pick five here and read a little bit more from this speech from what to the slave is the 4th of July in 1852 because he doesn't believe you'll see that the Founding Fathers created a document that was inherently racist. Same with the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. He wrote, and I will do not quite the justice of James Earl Jones, but I will try my level best. I have said that the Declaration of Independence is the ring bolt to the chain of your nation's destiny. So indeed, I regard it. The principles contained in that instrument are saving principles. Stand by those principles, be true to them on all occasions, in all places, against all foes, and at whatever cost. From the round top of your ship of state, dark and threatening clouds may be seen. Heavy billows, like mountains in the distance, Disclose to the leeward huge forms of flinty rocks. That bolt drawn, that chain broken, and all is lost. Cling to this day, cling to it, and to its principles, with the grasp of a storm-tossed mariner to a spar at midnight. Fellow citizens, I am not wanting in respect for the fathers of this republic. The signers of the Declaration of Independence were brave men. They were great men, too, great enough to give fame to a great age. It does not often happen to a nation to raise at one time such a number of truly great men. The point from which I am compelled to view them is not certainly the most favorable, and yet I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. They were statesmen, patriots, and heroes, and for the good they did and the principles they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. Touting the authors of the Declaration of Independence, many of whom were slaveholders, recognizing their contributions while at the same time condemning the institution of slavery in a way that only a slave could himself. Let's go to pick six, because it gets even more interesting as he starts talking about the U.S. Constitution. 
But I differ from those who charge this baseness, that is like slavery, and the harm of slavery upon slaves, the evil nature of the institution. I differ from those who charge this baseness on the framers of the Constitution of the United States. It is a slander upon their memory, at least so I believe. Fellow citizens, there is no matter in respect to which the people of the North have allowed themselves to be so ruinously imposed upon as that of the pro-slavery character of the Constitution. In that instrument I hold there is neither warrant, license, nor sanction of the hateful thing, but interpreted as it ought to be interpreted. The Constitution is a glorious liberty document. Read its preamble. Consider its purposes. Is slavery among them? Is it at the gateway? Or is it in the temple? It is neither. While I do not intend to argue this question on the present occasion, let me ask, if it be not somewhat singular, that if the Constitution were intended to be, by its framers and adopters, a slave-holding instrument, why neither slavery, slaveholding, nor slave can anywhere be found in it? What would be the thought of an instrument drawn up, legally drawn up, for the purpose of entitling the city of Rochester to a tract of land in which no mention of land was made. He notes that slavery is not contained as a word in the United States Constitution. It is a glorious liberty document that does not enshrine the institution of slavery. Its preamble doesn't even suggest that suggest something very different. In other words, what he's starting to get at here is that American society in the 1850s, when he was giving this speech, was not living up to its ideals, was far astray from the idea of liberty enshrined in the glorious liberty document that is the United States Constitution, and he was right. It is Washington Examiner Wednesday. Every Wednesday, we like to bring on one of our friends at The Examiner to talk about some of the key issues of the day. Thankfully, there's no shortage of things to talk about in the political climate that we've got going on right now. So today on this Washington Examiner Wednesday, I'm pleased to welcome to the program breaking news reporter at The Examiner, Emily Larson, joining us now. Emily, welcome to the show. It's good to have you. Great. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this conversation because we're going to dive into some developments that have happened since a couple months ago when I published an op-ed in the Washington Examiner entitled, Beware the Push for Nationwide Vote-by-Mail Election. Just to tee it up for one second, I want to read a snippet of this piece that I had back in May where I point out that on balance, vote-by-mail can be good when done right. Colorado, where I'm broadcasting from, for example, has held vote-by-mail elections where Republicans performed well and ones where Democrats did well. Compared to the national mood and voter registration numbers, the voting model doesn't really change outcomes. Additionally, election experts differ on whether in-person voting or vote-by-mail leads to more voter fraud. Yet even if vote-by-mail is generally positive, that doesn't mean 2020 is the year for nationwide expansion. I note that, as former Colorado Secretary of State Wayne Williams pointed out, it took the state a decade to get ready for vote-by-mail elections. Likewise, for Oregon and Washington, admittedly, those three states were pioneers and others would follow their lead, but the inherent complexities are inescapable. Emily Larson, you've been reporting quite a bit extensively every couple of weeks on vote by mail. And this week, you particularly had a piece talking about some of these challenges and potential delays. What are you noticing? Well, I think the number one thing I'm noticing from people following this issue is that they're trying to stress that if the election, the presidential election is in particular, is close in some of these swing states like um, Pennsylvania, Michigan, 
Florida. If it's close, then the rise of vote by mail and mail and absentee voting is going to mean that we're not going to have the results on election night as we have come to expect in previous cycles. It's going to look a lot more like the 2000 election than it is going to look like the 2016 election. And so, uh, the, and that's because there are inherent challenges in vastly expanding these vote by mail operations that um, states that don't already have a robust uh, mail-in voting system need to hire people to process all of these ballots. There are likely to be lawsuits about which ballots are counted or not, whether ballots that are uh, that arrive after election day should be counted. Um, legal issues can hold up these questions for months, uh, or not months, but weeks, and um, or days. It might take days to actually count the ballots. And so that's what um, elections experts are trying to stress to the general public right now. Yeah, I mean, we recall the 2000 election, and that one stretched out, what, like 36 days or so because it needed to go to the Supreme Court. Not only can you have counting delays, but imagine there are counting delays. Finally, all the ballots are counted a couple weeks in, and then the lawsuits start coming because there are some perceived irregularities happening and maybe mm -hmm. in some very pivotal states from the presidential election standpoint. Yeah, certainly. And some of those, um, the hanging chads of 2000 might take a different shape in the in the 2020 election. And that will be whether the signature on the front of the um, of the front of a ballot matches the signature for the voter on file or um, whether the, the person selected uh, too many candidates, whether the the how they filled out the ballot was able to be read or not. Um, those are things that can be resolved when you vote in person uh, at an in-person voting site, but um, are not going to be easy to fix if your ballot arrives on election day and there are elections administration, administrators that have to deal with that. So that will affect not only the presidential election, but all of the down ballot races as well. So especially in some of these congressional districts that are going to be very close, even in states that not might not be close in the presidential election that could affect um, the outcome of control of Congress and um, also a lot of local officials as well. As I've talked about on this program and discussed with election officials in Colorado, that signature verification, I mean, there's a lot involved because you need to get the database set up. You need to be able to uh, verify from IDs and, and what have you, how to, uh, whether or not these voters are actually legitimate eligible voters and, and so forth. And, and so there are a lot of these tricky situations. So the question is, how are new states that are just trying to bring this about in their areas, Emily Larson, how are they doing doing that and, and handling this? Is it starting to, to, to pick up where they're actually putting into place these systems? Or could we be getting to election day where suddenly everybody's like, wait a second, in our state, we're just not ready for this or not election day per se, but even a month before when you start sending out ballots? Well, they're starting to trying to put them in place. Um, California has already had a lot of mail-in voting um, for a long time, but it's certainly increased in the primary this year. And it took uh, weeks to count those ballots. And so we can expect the same thing to happen to, to a lot of other states that are trying to expand their systems um, as well. But we're getting to the point now where it's a little bit too late to actually expand the system anymore at this point. Um, the laws that are in place are going to be hard to um, change in order to have them actually implementable. Uh, so yes. at this point now, it's all about how the elections administrators are going to be administering this and um, whether the changes that have been made already are going to be um, are, are going to run smoothly on Election Day. Yeah. And one other thing that is important, by the way, the legal hurdles are certainly significant in many of these states where you actually have to change the law or figure out workarounds in order to make these kinds of vote by mail systems function in a particular state. But not only that, and I've talked with our former Deputy Secretary of State, Suzanne Steyard, about this. One other thing that Colorado's experience shows is that there aren't enough ballot printers around the country as well. So if you end up having a lot more states involved in uh, mail-in voting and they need the ballots, they could become sort of, remember earlier on in the coronavirus crisis, we were worried about having enough ventilators for hospitals. They could kind of be the new ventilators, at least for the COVID-19 era election. 
Certainly. Um, I've heard that ballot printing is an issue as well. There aren't enough companies with the capacity to print um, ballots for the increased demand that they're going to see. One of the things that some um, elections administrators and um, people who are really concerned about this are pushing is not focus on not only mail-in voting as a way to mitigate the risks of contracting the coronavirus at the polls, but also um, just to increase the time for voting. So instead of having an election a day, you have more of an election week. Um, you increase the number of hours that the polls are open in order to space out um, the people who can go to the polls. Um, the challenge is, of course, getting that message to voters that they can vote early and having enough elections administrators uh, who to, to man the polls at that time. Because yeah. typically these elections administrators are older and in the type of area and the type of age group that um, is at risk when it comes to coronavirus. Once again, we're talking with Emily Larson, breaking news reporter with our partners at the Washington Examiner on this Washington Examiner Wednesday edition of Jimmy at the Crossroads. Let's stay on the topic of mail-in ballot, but more the politics of the thing. I mean, President Trump for weeks, months has been railing against the idea of vote by mail. And you've had uh, some interesting reporting about the potential political implications on Republican voters and turnout in those states that start really making the shift to vote by mail and how President Trump's rhetoric could impact that. What are you finding? Sure. So there's mounting evidence that President Trump's extreme opposition to vote by mail is really uh, driving down Republican um, appetite for using the method at all. They think that it's going to be uh, corrupt. They think that um, they don't. They want to make sure their ballots are counted. So there are a lot of valid concerns that they have, but it's the um, opposition to vote by mail among Republicans is going down while while Democrats are really um, wanting to use the method. And so uh, the most recent evidence of this is uh, CBS YouGov poll out of Florida and Texas. Um, well, in Florida, 59% of, of Biden voters said that they would want to vote by mail. That would be their preferred method compared to 25% of Trump voters, which in itself is not necessarily bad unless you get to the point where um, you go to, you're a Republican and you go to the polls on the election day and it's not set up in a way to where it's easy to vote. And you have some voters on the margins or swing voters who decide that it's not worth their time to stand in line for hours or um, it's too complicated to vote. And so they don't vote. And so that's the risk that Republicans run with um, demonizing vote by mail, especially uh, President Trump keeping on this. Another important thing to keep in mind about that is even as states are trying to expand vote by mail in um, a number of states, in the most important six swing states this year, um, they already have vote by mail. That was already no excuse. Absentee voting was already in place in the most uh, in the six most important swing states. So this is going to be a challenge for Trump, no matter what. Crocky, that was the biggest bloody mosquito I've ever seen. Wait. Coming in. Oh, oh, good day, mate. You know, after a long day of kangarangling and crock roping, a man can really work up an appetite. Not to mention a whopper of a backache. I know a place, and that's why I like coming into the back out steakhouse. The back out is the only place I know where you can sit down in a lumbar support baka lounger and enjoy a big juicy bandicoot steak or a thick koala chop served by a licensed chiropractor. And as you partake of your meal, your server will provide you with a spinal manipulation, neck twist, the hip alignment, the full Matilda. One visit to the back out steakhouse and your spirits will return like an Abbo's boomerang. So the next time your back goes on walkabout and you're coincidentally, simultaneously, craving a slab of cooked meat, Waltz on into the back out steakhouse. You not only feel good down under, but all over. Back out steakhouse. Mmm. Ah. Good stuff, eh, Skippy? Bloody boomerangs. Back out steakhouse. Mmm. Ah. 
Hey, this is Frankie. Hey, and I'm Angelo. We're the owners of FNA Pizzeria. If you're looking for the best pizza in town, remember us. FNA. Hey, we got the best crust. FNA. We got the best cheese. FNA. We got the best sauce. FNA, man. Put it all together. What do you got? FNA. Yeah, you got that right. FNA. FNA Pizza on the corner of Hell yeah Avenue and Dan Straight Street. You're not. I'll, I'll give you the alternative. You're not sure. Sure. You've got to create 30 million jobs over three years. Yeah. Tell me what companies can do that. So first tell me of what all, 20 or 50 or 100 companies I, can do that. I can't tell you a specific companies that can do that because I don't know. In fact, or investors. I, I, but but, but, but I the greatest investors of right. all time. Well, but I don't presume to think that I know who's going to be the best investor, or the best company to do that. Just as I don't think the government is uh, that I can presume that the government's going to be effective to do that. Gonna talk money, gonna talk politics, with all generations, oh, what a great mix, no, I said. Clear. Has been on a determined campaign to convince the world that everything is hunky-dory. And when the government actually spends so much effort trying to convince you of something, uh, you gotta be very suspicious. Uh, your lawyers don't tell you even all the evidence that the government has given them, the few meager disclosures that were made literally at the 11th hour after you'd already been coerced into pleading guilty. Hours of video evidence of Nancy Pelosi coming up on your porches and jujitsuing your precious packages while Chuck Schumer waits in the street in the getaway van because he's too afraid to be a man and do his own dirty work. Come on, Jimmy, what you got? Is it scary that YouTube and Twitter and, and Facebook have this kind of power over us? Of course it is. But you know what? These things didn't always exist and they won't always exist. David beat Goliath. The little guy can beat the big guy. So we have to figure out ways to fight in which we are able to have that kind of reach. We can build our own megaphones. Um, and this is going to take, this is a little bit of a longer term project. It goes beyond Trump's uh, re-election because it affects every election. I'm good, man. We're a part. It's a partnership. We're like this, Jimmy. I, we got, I got you. Jimmy, can I tell you that I've done about 200 shows in the last three weeks for this book tour? This has been by far my favorite interview. And that, my friends, is how America was made great once again. Breaking at this hour, Jimmy Sangenberger is currently at the crossroads of politics and economics. Radio broadcaster master. Now the celeb on the web. He's the smarty of the party. He's in cahoots with the grassroots. Jimmy at the Crossroads brings you thought-provoking commentary, hard-hitting interviews, original satire, and the best bumper music known to man, Jimmy at the Crossroads. I got Jimmy at the Crossroads, making sense out of no sense. And now, the further future adventures of Starship, Starship Winkler. In today's episode, the captain is making travel plans. Sparks, open up a frequency to Price Expediosity line. Yes, Captain. Hello, and welcome to Price Expediosity line. How can I help you? Well, I'll need a room. Are you traveling alone? Yes. Oh, well, that's a shame. Never found the right woman, huh? Well, there was this... No, wait, just book me a bed. King, queen, fool, twin, Murphy, or bunk. King, you never know. Well, as long as you're convinced. All right, name your price. Name my price? That's how it works. Name your price. Six bucks? Six bucks it is. Let's plug it in here. Bippity boppity boo and... Sorry, you are outbid. By how much? A penny. Someone bid six. Oh, one. Who? Oh boy, I just booked a room for six dollars and one cent. Well, will the captain ever make a good bet bid? Tune in next time when we hear... Here's one for six oh two... I'll take it! ...thousand dollars. No! Oh, damn dramatic pauses on Starship, Starship Winkler! Do you wear a 
to play? Do you yell out, Spock? Do you put in pauses when you talk? Do you start real soft and then go real loud? Have you won two Emmys? Do you love a crowd? Whatever makes you feel like a shatner. Yeah, you got lots of macho and swagger. You had alien affairs. You sing bad, but no one cares. You find low airline fares. If you like to work, got a handsome smirk. If you're Captain Kirk, whatever makes you feel like a me. Phases on stunt. Here on Jimmy at the Crossroads, we always like to talk with newsmakers when we can, and that's part of the reason why I am very pleased to welcome back to Jimmy at the Crossroads. We haven't had him on in a few months, but it's about time we brought him back. U.S. Senator from Colorado, Corey Gardner, joins us here on the program. Senator, good to talk with you, sir. Welcome. Hey, good talking to you. Thanks for having me, Jimmy. jump right into a few different topics of the day. I want to talk about the state of your race for United States Senate here in a few minutes. But first, there's a big debate going on in D.C., a lot of backroom conversations, but now things are out front, too, on what to do in regards to the economy as we're still trying to address this economic malaise due to the coronavirus pandemic. The HEALS Act was just introduced this week in the United States Senate. What do you make of the legislation? Well, look, this is going to be a starting point of conversation about what we need to do to address three primary things, a filter that I look at, uh, look through uh, to make decisions on every action we take when it comes to this pandemic. Uh, Number one, are we stopping the spread of the coronavirus? Are we flattening the curve? And we need to take measures to do those two things. Uh, Two, secondly, we need to make sure that we're helping individuals, people who are out of work, uh, they're sheltering in place, uh, unable to go to work, they've lost their jobs, making sure that they're okay. And three, what we can do to make sure that businesses are able to get their doors back open, uh, people back to work. We have to do all three things at the same time. You don't do one and then two and then three. And so that's what I'm looking at and that's how I'm analyzing this legislation. Uh, But it's gonna have to come out of the Senate with bipartisan support. That's just the nature of the Senate. And I look forward to helping the people of Colorado based on those three parameters. Yeah, so, Senator Garner, we're talking as well in the Republican proposal of a trillion dollars. The Democrats want to spend even more in the House proposal. I mean, we already have spent multi trillions on this pandemic and government responses. What do you make of the budgetary implications of this and how we can even afford it? Well, it's, it's a it's a huge concern. Uh, right. Uh, I mean, we know we had a, a budget challenge, a deficit problem, a debt problem going into coronavirus and certainly spending more money to get out of it makes that even more challenging. But if we don't have an economy that gets moving again, if we uh, have even more unemployment, if we have businesses that close and don't reopen, uh, how will we ever pay back what we spent even before coronavirus, let alone what we're doing in the middle of it? So uh, we have to right now uh, undertake the best efforts we can to get this country moving again, to get our schools safely open, uh, to provide solutions on a vaccine and treatments and therapeutics, to make sure businesses are able to get their doors open, to rehire people again. So we have to make sure that we don't create disincentives to work. We have to make sure that we create incentives uh, for businesses opening again uh, and making sure that we get through this together. So, uh, you know, government said shut down. Uh, They did it out of love for their neighbor and their community and to stop the spread of coronavirus. Now we have a responsibility to give it, get it moving and back open again. Senator Cory Gardner, one of the questions that uh, people have been discussing is the unemployment provision. The previous CARES Act had $600 a week that was given additional to the basic unemployment amount to people. Now the Republican proposal, the HEALS Act, is $200. Democrats are saying that's not nearly enough. What's your take on that? Because we have seen this show to be a bit of a disincentive to work. Some people saying, ah, I'm making more money on unemployment than going back to work. Yeah, I think uh, both Republicans and Democrats alike want to make sure that we're helping people in need, uh, but not creating an unfair uh, competition between the government and the private sector. So let's continue to help those people who need it. 
uh, let's create jobs and get people into the workforce without a disincentive. The people of Colorado want to work. Uh, people who don't have a job right now, they want to work. But let's not make sure let, let's make sure that we don't put the government in the place of the private sector in terms of unfair competition. Now, Senator Gardner, one more thing on the economy and the implications here of this legislation. Uh, when you have the government trying to figure out, OK, we give money to businesses for the Paycheck Protection Program, maybe enhance that some more. You've got the unemployment provisions. You've got a variety of different aspects. How reliable are these programs, do you think, in helping us to get the economic years rolling again? Or is this more of a relief package right now than a stimulus package? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, you've got uh, uh, the, the, the sort of the stimulus uh, in terms of helping individuals with uh, costs that they may have uh, incurred or ability to go out into the marketplace and spend money that they have uh, otherwise uh, decided not to because they're able to. They feel more comfortable doing that. Uh, we also have the Paycheck Protection Program expansions in this. Uh, under certain circumstances, a, a loan that has already been issued under the pay, Paycheck Protection Program, uh, you could go back and get a second draw on that loan. Uh, you know, to help you meet e even more expenses going forward if you're having additional challenges in this economy. Uh, so it is sort of relief for that business. It's also stimulative in terms of getting those dollars into the economy. Uh, so I think this bill is trying to create uh, both uh, both uh, fronts uh, an answer for what we have to do to get this country moving again. Yesterday, in Denver, Colorado, the sixth annual pro-police rally, law enforcement appreciation day rally took place at a venue called Civic Center Park in downtown Denver near the Colorado State Capitol. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. together a number of us for the sixth time in a five-year period so first time was July 19th 2015 this was not a random event that has never occurred before or that was specifically tied to the protests that we're seeing across the country this is something that has been going on for years and I've been a proud participant for I think five, maybe five of the of the years in downtown Denver. And I've been able to perform harmonica along with the band, and it's always a good time. It is really a wholesome time. It was family friendly for years until yesterday. <laughs> There are two things as I bring on the organizer, Ron McLaughlin, that I want you to know about what yesterday tells us. Number one, make no mistake about it. These radicals are not peaceful. A peaceful demonstration was happening. A peaceful celebration was happening. Music was playing. And they stopped it forcibly. You'll see some more video today from my vantage point predominantly, and some photographs on what happened yesterday at the pro-police rally, Colorado, 6th annual Law Enforcement Appreciation Day gathering put on largely by lead organizer Ron McLaughlin, who I am pleased to welcome to Jimmy at the Crossroads right now here on the program. Ron, my friend, welcome to the show. It's good to have you. Oh, Jimmy, thank you so much. Thanks for being there yesterday, and thanks for having me on the show today. Well, I, I appreciate it, and we'll get to why you have uh, some coverings on your forehead here in, in a moment, but I want to ask you, what happened yesterday, Ron McLaughlin? It was, 
it was a, it was unfortunate in many ways. Uh, there are a lot of really good people that came out yesterday to have a good time, to celebrate their men and women in law enforcement. And these guys need to have that celebration. They're completely under the gun at all times. But it was overran by a group of people that see things a bit differently. And it could have been handled differently by our, our police, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the sheriff, or the, not sheriff, but the chief and I did speak on Thursday and again on Friday about this event. Um, I was on the phone with another uh, member of the police department uh, leading up to this event uh, throughout the day. And uh, what was going on across the street. I had people that were watching to see how things were going to unfold across the street. They were unimpeded. They, uh, they got their, got riled up and they were just let go. And the, the eventually, the guys that really wanted to do what they need to do, which are the police guys on the grounds, eventually they were allowed to actually step in. But at that point, they were doing not much more than just showing a presence. And uh, they were allowed to overrun the people that have, we have a permit, uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a space that we've been at uh, consistently. It's our sixth one. The chief knew very, very well what was going on. And they, did, they never put anybody to block anybody from coming in yeah. to see us. Yeah. Uh, that's unfortunate. Ron McLaughlin, when you were in contact with the police, particularly in the lead up to this rally, what did they tell you? Did they um, support your effort to do this, at least the chief of police and his uh, top brass? Did they discourage you from holding the rally? Did they suggest other venues? Okay. Now, bear in mind, for the last six weeks, we've really been pushing this on Facebook. Uh, at that point, we weren't at quite 60,000 feeds that have gone out. 3,000 likes, another 1,000 shares on just my page alone, not to mention everybody else's page. Thursday afternoon, I get a phone call, and they're asking me if I would change the venue and move it over to Pepsi Center and be out there, not like inside the Pepsi Center, but out at the Pepsi Center where there would be space to put us up. Why? Uh, they were afraid that something like this might happen. There's a group of an, or, an organized group that's on the other side of the, uh, Veterans Park over by the Capitol. That's all about socialism, or not socialism, uh, basically communism. It's ridiculous crap that these guys are into, from my perspective. But they were concerned that these guys might come over, and <clears throat> I, and the chief also said that if we have this event, that we're going to go backwards and not forwards. And I asked the chief, I said, how is it possible for us to go forward if we give in to the bullies? If, if we don't stand up for what we believe in in, a, in, a, in our own city, how is that going forward by giving in to these children? And, and this is what these guys are. These are little kids. In the they were blowing the bubbles. <laughs> children blow bubbles. It was, but they scream, they yell, and they pitch a fit, kind of like that girl on Willy Wonka in the, in the chocolate factory, give me more. It's It's beyond the pale. And uh, I didn't see how moving the venue would make sense. A mile down the road, as if they're not gonna walk a mile down the road to make a statement, that doesn't make sense. Uh, my, my insurance that I have for the event that I carry, it's, it's specific to a location. How could I, once I move the venue, the venue, the, it would be done. We wouldn't have been able to have the event. And the idea of coming back next year, when everything is all calm and cute and sweet, that doesn't make sense either. In the meantime, in that conversation, however, the, the police did let me know that for the last, four, since basically May 28th, that there's been uh, mischief and mayhem, rioting going on in our city every night, anywhere from 30 to 300 people going through different neighborhoods and terrorizing these neighborhoods. So how, in any way, shape or form, is that what, how, what we're, how is that a win? So we give in to these children that are pitching a fit, and yet the, the, the citizens that are having their lives disrupted every single night, that's okay, they can put up with it. We're gonna appease these children. That says a lot about what's going on with our mayor, how he wants to end our city council. Everybody is always in a hurry to throw the <clears throat> police officer under the bus, like picking the pepper out of the fly poop on any incident whatsoever. 
But the reality is these men and women, they are the messenger. The message is coming from the people's uh, mayors and their city councils. But you never see a mayor. You never see a city council person say, hey, guys, that's our fault. We thought this might work, but it didn't. That never happens. They just keep throwing these men and women in law enforcement under the bus. And when they do that, they're throwing us under the bus. It, it's ridiculous. I am so pleased to finally have with us here on the program the sheriff for Weld County in northern Colorado, Steve Reams, who is a true patriot and was there yesterday to show support for his fellow law enforcement officers, even as Law Enforcement Appreciation Day was rudely and violently interrupted by thugs. Sheriff Reams, welcome to the show. It's good to have you, sir. Thanks for having me on, Jimmy. Uh, I I wish it was under better circumstances than talking about a failed event. Me too. And I appreciate you coming on and bearing with us through some of these technical problems. So you are a law enforcement officer. You are a sheriff of a county. You hope to continue to be a sheriff of that county after November. From your vantage point, sir, what went down yesterday? Well, yesterday uh, was an absolute failure on the Denver Police Department's ability to plan to uh, provide a safe venue for a permitted uh, rally that was actually designed to support them and all other law enforcement officers in the state of Colorado. As you well know, this was the sixth annual law enforcement law enforcement appreciation event. Um, you know, the organizers of the event had gone through the correct process to to get it uh, permitted with the city of Denver. They had the venue reserved, and the Denver Police Department was uh, well aware of what was taking place. They were also well aware of uh, the measures that the protesters were taking. It's unfortunate that the Denver Police Department, knowing that uh, we had a, an event scheduled and knowing that our protesters, our protesters were uh, planning to ruin the event, didn't take any affirmative action to try to create a zone that would stop the, the, the rioters, the protesters from coming in and invading our event. And ultimately, that's what they ended up doing. They took over the event. And uh, they were trying to incite violence. Uh, they, they got what they were asking for a couple of times. And uh, ultimately, they ruined the event that was there to honor um, the, the police across the state of Colorado, the Denver police. And the Denver police, in all fairness, stood by and let it happen. Now, they stood by and let it happen. Why? Why was that? Because it seems to be it was not the police making a determination right then and there. Hey, you know what? Why don't we not intervene and protect people but it came down from the chief who probably got it from the mayor yeah i mean it's pretty obvious i I talked with several of the denver officers that were there um you know without naming names they were just as frustrated as anybody at the rules of engagement that were provided to them by their by their leadership if you want to use that term and there's also a factor that i don't know if it's been mentioned but uh recently in colorado senate bill 217 was passed that really uh, changes the rules of engagement for uh, law enforcement officers and it makes it very difficult to control a a riot, uh, which honestly, that's what happened. We had a riot breakout yesterday and the officers were kind of on their heels for what they could or couldn't do and uh, that became glaringly apparent. Yeah, again, we're talking with Steve Ream, Sheriff for Weld County, Colorado, which is in northern Colorado. And when we look at what happened yesterday, I made, I've made i been making this point with every guest, and I'm wondering your thoughts on this, Sheriff Reams. And that is, look, the reality of the situation is that they could not have done this and would not have done this if they didn't think that they could get away with it. It was so brazen and so disgusting, yet they did it anyway normally you have two separate gatherings a protest and a counter protest or a rally and a protest of that rally and they are separated from some distance they didn't even try to uh, do some sort of separation for themselves and so they said well, we're just going to go mess things up yeah you know that's to the point i was making earlier uh, the the denver police department had every uh, pre-warning that there was going to be a crowd that was going to come in and try to overtake our event um, they had all the uh, all the ability to establish a zone between the the two groups uh, if they if they had chosen to or if they had been allowed to. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. And I think you're correct. The protesters, the uh, the Antifa folks, whatever whatever label you want to give them, they're figuring out the rules for engagement 
and they're actually now starting to define those rules for the Denver Police Department. Uh, instead of Denver being proactive, they're being completely reactive. They're not allowed to take any uh, measures that would help ensure safety. So by that factor alone, the the uh, the folks that are down there causing lawlessness and anarchy are are doing just that. They're getting better and better at it, and they're they're causing more and more problems. And yesterday uh, was a was a glaring example of how the the police department are basically on roller skates. They have no way to to affirmatively go out and deal with stuff, and that's by policy, by law, and just by the mere factor of uh, the, the fact that they're outnumbered. There's there's more uh, lawless protesters down there than anyone else. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's special best of edition of Jimmy at the Crossroads. Be sure to check out the full interviews and full monologues at jimmyatthecrossroads.com and on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash jimmyatthecrossroads. Please subscribe today if you have not done so already. And also at the Facebook page for Jimmy Sangenberger Media Personality, facebook.com slash Jimmy Sangenberger Pro. You can find all of our videos there as well. So that is it for us today here again on Jimmy at the Crossroads. My thanks to Nathan Matouche, producer extraordinaire, once again working the Matouche magic here on the show. My thanks to the guests you saw today, Emily Larson, Senator Cory Gardner, Sheriff Steve Reams, Ron McLaughlin. My thanks to you for watching, subscribing, listening, sharing our content. Please do share it. We appreciate it. And my thanks to our friends and partners at the Washington Examiner. Speaking of the Examiner, tomorrow, Washington Examiner Wednesday. Day. Be sure to tune in. Do not miss it. Stay well, stay healthy, stay safe, and may God bless America.